we have the privilege of doing something we get to do just once a year. Every year we have the opportunity for each of us to read all the way through the Bible and then uh, get a certificate of appreciation. It's appreciation for me as a pastor because God's Word is the most important thing here. And that is something that I, I truly encourage every one of you to do. And I hope that you have done it even if you have not reported it. But we would like to give some of those certificates this morning to those who have read through the entire Bible in 2011. The first certificate of achievement is presented to Miss Lois Kern. And Lois, you can stay there. I will come down and give it to you. going to get my exercise today because the next one is behind me in the choir loft, Miss Carol Elwell. Now let's see. The next one is also in the choir, Miss Shirley Lee.
Now we have several who are not able to be with us today. Uh, Mrs. Alice McIntyre has read through the Bible in the year 2011. And Mrs. Pauline Souter. And Mrs. Carol Lloyd Whitbeck. Now, if you have read through the Bible and your name was not called today, I still have a couple more certificates here. And uh, we would be glad to honor you if you'll let Mrs. Whitbeck know that we'll have those certificates printed up on your behalf. Now, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation, which is where our text for today is. In Revelation chapter 21, we've looked at verses 1 through 5 in our reading this morning. It's a very important passage of scripture because it tells us that for the believer there is hope in the future. Many times we enter a new year and we have made New Year's, new year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions are all well and fine, but if we knew there was something that was wrong in our lives that needed to be changed, we should not wait for the new year to do it. There is nothing magical about that day although it is an easy day to remember. But if we have sin in our life, our responsibility is as soon as we know it to confess it as sin and to turn from it, to repent and to begin to walk in paths of holiness and righteousness. So as we begin a new year, we are reminded of things past, but we are also encouraged about things that are yet future. This morning we read our responsive reading out of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and we spent some time looking at that last night at our New Year's Eve service as we entered the new year with our Lord Jesus Christ partic participating together in the Lord's table that the first act of our new year might be a fellowship between believers and their Lord. But in that passage of scripture that we read last night and which we read this morning again for our responsive reading, we see that God has times for things. God has times for people. God has times for civilizations. But God also has time for the individual. You and I live in the context of a culture. God has placed us in the United States for such a time as this as Mordecai said to Esther, our times are in his hands. You are not here accidentally. You are not here just as some kind of a chance event of the history of your parents. You are here because God has a purpose for you. There is a purpose for everything under the heavens. We have read that. There is someday going to come a point at which no longer are we in the context of this culture. No longer in the con context of this civilization. No longer in the context of this world. But we will be in the context of heaven. Within the last several weeks, some of our number have entered that context already. They're in the presence of the Savior. But you and I still have a responsibility in this world for this time. Our Lord Jesus Christ, just before he went into heaven, made it very clear that we are to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. There is coming, as we have just read in Revelation chapter 21, a new Jerusalem. The earthly Jerusalem still has those who are lost and headed for hell. The earthly Judea still has those who are lost and are headed for hell. 
The earthly Samaria still has those who are lost and headed for hell. And the earth in which we now live still has those who are lost and are headed for hell. But there is coming a day, and John gives it to us in verse 1 here, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I think when most of us think about the new heaven and the new earth, we think about a planet very much like our own right now. But there are going to be some surprising differences, not only topographical differences as we see in this verse, but there are going to be some intrinsic changes to everything about it. You and I have already experienced some of those changes. In fact, some of the newness and there is so much that the scripture speaks of. We'll, we'll be looking at a number of those verses today. But you and I have already experienced some of the newness that is coming with the new heaven and the new earth. The Apostle Paul explains it. If any man be in Christ, he is, not will be, he is a new creature. Behold, I make all things New. That is our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. And he has begun that process of making all things new by making all things for us as believers new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Do you see yourself that way? As you go through the humdrum of daily living, as you enter a new year with expectancy and with all the prospects before you that you think will be good in this year, do you view yourself the way God views you? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What are you still holding on to of the old things that do not please our Heavenly Father? It's like the dead scab on the skin. It's still there. New flesh is growing underneath it. And that thing is going to fall off. And all things will be new that are under it. You and I have, have this accrusion of all kinds of, of things of the world, of the wickedness, of the sins that we cling to so desperately. Jesus is the one who makes all things new. Why should we hold on to that which is old, that which is fading, that which passes away as the scripture speaks of it? when we have all things new. John goes on in verse 2, he says, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. As we take that verse there and look at the Apostle Paul's uh, declaration in Ephesians chapter 5, where he is describing the relationship of the husband and the wife, and how they portray a very special heavenly relationship. We are reminded that the husband portrays Jesus Christ, and the church portrays the bride of Christ. She is the bride of the husband. Men and women, are you living that way? All things have become new. In your relationship one with another, husbands, are you living with your wife as Christ does with the church? 
Are you faithful to her in the way that you think? Are you faithful to her consistently so in the place that your eyes travel? Are you faithful to her in the way that you deal with other women and speak to them and make implications to them? Ladies, are you faithful to your husband? Are you, as the scripture describes the bride, adorned in beautiful white? Are you adorned in purity and modesty? Do you love your husband with all of your heart, as the church is to love Christ? Do you obey your husband, and are you in submission to him, or are you the neck that turns the head? I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, not old Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem's been around a long, long time. We find it in Genesis chapter 18, where Melchizedek, king of Salem, that's the ancient name for Jerusalem, Melchizedek comes forth through Abraham. He meets him with bread and wine. He blesses Abraham, and Abraham gives him a tithe of all. And Hebrews chapters 5 through 7 speak of Melchizedek and talking about the things that he did and who he was without father, without mother, without beginning of days, without end of life, made like unto the Son of God. Abideth the priest continually. Jerusalem's been around a long time. Jerusalem has been conquered over and over by its enemies, and then it's been re-inhabited. And God placed his name on Jerusalem. He calls it the apple of his eye. And anyone who touches the apple of his eye will feel the consequences. The apple of your eye is your pupil. If someone were to poke you in the eye, would you be happy about it? But that Jerusalem is getting old. It was the city of the great King David. It was the city in which our Lord made his triumphal entry. It is the city from which he will rule during the thousand-year millennial reign. But it is a city that has been tainted by sin. And someday there will be the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven a city that has never been conquered, a city which has not experienced the ravages of war, a city in which there has been no sin, a city where our Lord reigns in glory, and it's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Prepared. Do you remember John chapter 14? Our Lord Jesus Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. We are the bride of Christ. Where is it that we will dwell? What is this city that is prepared as a bride adorned for her husband? What a beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ and of his bride, the church. In verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Of whom is it speaking, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit, when it says God himself shall be with them and be their God? Who is it when it says he will dwell with them and they shall be his people? Who is it when it is speaking of the tabernacle of God is with men? John tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 14, And the word was made flesh and dwelt, here we have dwelt, among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you know what that word dwelt is? It's the word skene in Greek. It means he pitched 
His tent. He pitched His tabernacle. It takes us back to the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel as they are coming out of Egypt and the tabernacle is there and God is dwelling in the midst of His people. The camps with three on each side of each of those twelve tribes surrounding that center where the glory of God is manifest in the Shekinah where you have the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day and God is dwelling in the midst of His people. Who was it that was the dweller of the Shekinah glory? John tells us in John chapter 12 that it was Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. He has pitched his tent among us. A picture taking us back to the book of Exodus and God's people surrounding the place where they met him at the mercy seat and where the high priest sprinkled the blood once a year on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. There was a priest who went in and who there offered sacrifice both for himself and for the sins of the people. Hilasterion is the word in the New Testament translated propitiation. It is also the root from which the word translated mercy seat comes. And it tells us that Jesus Christ himself is our hilasterion. He is our mercy seat. It's the picture of Jesus Christ dwelling in the midst of his people. His blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat between the cherubim. His glory ascending from the mercy seat over the tabernacle. The tabernacle being the picture of his body and the rending of the veil, the rending of his flesh on the cross. He did that so that he might make all things new. What a picture the book of Hebrews gives to us of those magnificent and wonderful events. It's been called the veil of tears, this place in which we live. We wander through the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping, so long as we are here on this earth. But there is coming a day, according to verse 4, it says, And God, and who is this? It is Jesus Christ, because God himself shall be with them in verse 3, and be their God. He is the one who is now wiping away our tears in verse 4. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Do you notice how many times we see all here? It's not part, it's all. It's all. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You see, he's going to make all things new. What an encouragement and a hope as we move into a new year. Years have beginnings and ends. But when God makes all things new, there will be no end. We move into the eternal state God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Right now, life is punctuated by death. Right now, it's a cycle. We see life coming into being. We see couples joining together and having children. We see old age approaching and death. And the cycle through their children and through their grandchildren and through their great-grandchildren continues to go on. It's the only way that it continues to go on. For it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. But there is coming a day when there will be no more death. There will be no more cycle. 
Life will continue not because merely reproduction is going on, but because God gives us freedom from death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Were you sad at all during this past year? Did you cry even once during this past year? Did you feel any pain during this past year? Then you know that what is written here has not yet occurred. There are those who try to spiritualize and allegorize away this text of scripture here. But they lie to themselves because they've still experienced sorrow and crying and pain. And God's word promises that there is a day coming when those things will have passed away. Not merely passed away for the individual, but it says they will have passed away. It's not merely us individually entering heaven. It's telling us that all things are going to be made new. It says the former things are passed away. Friends, that's joyful. You realize that we are so much closer to these events taking place than when they were written. Than last year, than the year before that. We are moving in this direction. It may be this year that Jesus Christ comes back for his bride, the church. It may be this year that we're raptured into heaven to partake of the wedding feast of the Lamb. Are you ready? Whenever we take the Lord's Supper, we always like to quote at the end of that, 1 John, where he reminds us concerning that blessed hope, that rapture of the church, he reminds us that every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. If you have the true belief, the true faith that Jesus Christ might come back for you at any moment, how does it affect your life? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. There should be an earnest desire for holiness. An earnest desire for purity. An earnest desire to be in fellowship at every moment of the day. An earnest desire to be about our master's business. Because we have been made new creatures in Christ. And yet how we hang on to those old, ugly scabs of the world. Verse 5. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make only a few things new. That's not what he said. Who is it that is sitting upon the throne? Who is it that is the King of kings and the Lord of lords? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. He is the one who has been speaking through this entire passage. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Either Jesus is telling us the truth or he's not telling us the truth. He's speaking here of that which will be as we see the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God. He's talking of a time when the earth will be changed physically. There will be no more sea. God's people will be dwelling on earth in the New Jerusalem. There will be this magnificent, and I wish we had time to study it, it's 1,500 miles tall, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles thick. Radiating light from its dead center where the throne is located and Jesus Christ is sitting. It's got 
streets of transparent gold. It's made of precious stones that glisten many different colors. Oh, what a beautiful picture we are given of the new Jerusalem. That's where you and I will live with our Lord. Behold, I make all things new. If you doubt those dimensions, study Revelation 21 and 22 where they're given. Look up what it means by a furlong. See how big it is, this place that God is preparing for those who love him and whom he loves. Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write. Oh, how we thank God for the written word of God. God doesn't say, well, if you'd like to take a few notes and then scribble something down later. He says, right. This is God's promise. Right. For these words are true and faithful. He doesn't say these big ideas are true and faithful. He doesn't say these general concepts are true and faithful. God has given us a precise revelation in his word. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The word of God is faithful and the word of God is true and these promises will be fulfilled for Jesus himself has said so. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, Behold, all things are passed away, all things are become new. I'm just going to give you a few others. Our time is out, but there are a few other passages I'd like to share with you where it talks about the new things. There are many in the book of Revelation. We won't be able to look at all of them. But Revelation 2.17, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written. We all like our names down here, or at least most folks do. Pretty proud of them. Many of those names do bring glory to God. But you know there's coming a day when you're going to get a new name. He's making all things new. We will have a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. We find there's another name, Revelation 3.12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Revelation 5.9. And they sung a new song. The most glorious music here on earth doesn't hold a candle. To what is coming in heaven. God is a God of music. He rejoices over us with singing. He joys over us with joy. He rejoices in his love. There's a new song in heaven. Oh, we think of the magnificent music of Christmas. We think of Handel's Messiah. We think of the various oratorios of Bach where the scripture text is set to gorgeous music that actually enhances the text and exalts it and helps us understand it. But there's coming a day when there will be a new song. A new song in our lips and it's being sung before the throne. They sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. We find the new song in chapter 5. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. We've already seen in chapter 21 the new heavens and the new earth. We see that there are new things also spoken of by Peter, 2 Peter 3.13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth and here is the key difference between the old heavens and the old earth and the new heavens 
and the new earth, the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Dear friends, we are citizens not of earth. We are citizens of heaven. We're merely visitors here on earth right now. We're merely transients. We're merely passing through. As the song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Because he has made us new creatures. The new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's why we're exhorted to be pure, to be holy, to have an earnest burning desire for that which is godly and righteous. It's like the difference between a lamb and a pig. You take the pig and throw him into the mire and he loves it. He wallows in it. That's his element. You take a lamb and throw him into the mud. And he gets out just as fast as he can and tries to get the mud off himself. We are new creatures. The Holy Spirit dwells inside each of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. We now have a new nature. There's a war going on in our bodies. Behold, I make all things new. Hebrews 9.15. How did he do it? Three marvelous passages out of the book of Hebrews. For this cause he is the mediator of a new testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, that is the law of Moses. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. How did he do it? It tells us by means of death. Hebrews 12, 24, And Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. It's not only by means of death, but it's by the means of the sprinkling of the blood of Christ the one who by his blood is the mediator of the new covenant. Chapter 10, verse 20. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. And here he's been speaking of the tabernacle of which we spoke earlier. Through the veil, the veil was rent. Oh, what a picture of our access to God. Through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. We've just celebrated Christmas. That's the reason for the incarnation. He had to be God in order to save us eternally. He had to be man in order to shed his blood. He had to be sinless so that his sacrifice would be acceptable before a holy, a holy, a holy, righteous God. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. We enter a new year. God is working in you. To conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. That image is a holy image. As you enter this year, will you do it with the same old, same old? Or will you enter this year with the earnest desire to live a holy life that is pleasing to God? So that when he returns, he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this year that is past.
Again, we thank you, Father, for all that you have done in this past year to bring us through the difficulties, to work on us as only you can do to eradicate areas where there is wickedness and sin in our lives. We thank you, Father, for the times of blessing. We thank you also for the times of chastening. We thank you, Father, for the times of bounty. But we also thank you for the times when there seemed to be a lack because it forced us to turn to you, to lift up our eyes as the maid does to her mistress and as the servant does to his master. So we wait upon thee, O Lord, our God. You draw us to yourself with cords of love. You draw us to yourself with your holy discipline. You draw us to yourself that we might enjoy the eternal fellowship that has been provided through the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son. And as we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Father, give us the desire. You have already provided the enablement through your Holy Spirit. Give us the desire to live holy lives that are pleasing to you as we look forward with expectancy to our Lord's return. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.